And you're good to go. Okay, okay we're re ready to go? Yes, we're good to go. Um, hi, this is Lauren Fondal, and I'm the biosolids coordinator with EPA Region 9 in San Francisco. And I'm talking today about sludge and septage lagoons and surface disposal and what are our EPA requirements for these. And uh, what are the different options for handling these? And uh, we'll, uh, um, you know, uh, post your questions uh, versus via the chat box, and then we'll answer them as they come up or every little bit. Um, and um, let's see, next slide. So what this will cover is um, uh, what is uh, what we call surface disposal of sewage sludge and what is temporary storage of sewage sludge or septage and when does temporary storage become surface disposal and what are the requirements under our regulations at 40 CFR 503 for surface disposal of sludge and then what are some of the other options for handling sewage sludge? See, next slide. Um, here's an example of a disposal site that needs quite a bit of correcting. This is a um, septage that's been placed on lands uh, by the Hoop Hoopa Tribes contractor, and uh, they uh, essentially have what's a cesspool at this point. It's not a septage disposal site, so we're working with them to try to get this corrected and get the funding so that this can be converted into a real uh, surface disposal site. Next slide. Um, there are several options that are used for disposing of sewage sludge and septage. Uh, one of them is land application for growing crops. And this is where you have a specific crop in mind, such as alfalfa or uh, wheat or another uh, feed or fiber crop and then you apply the sewage or sleptage for growing that. And then another option used by a lot of facilities is sending the sludge to a composter who treats it further and then uh, land applies it for growing other crops. And then surface disposal, which we're looking at here, is you're putting the sludge on the land for the purpose of disposal, not for the purpose of growing crops. And then another common alternative is to send it to a municipal landfill. And at that point, the landfill itself is covered under EPA regulations at 40 CFR 258. Uh, and they address it. And uh, at a landfill, the sludge will be mixed in with other things going into the landfill. Uh, and it also can be used as alternative daily cover at the landfill. But there's a whole separate set of regulations covering landfills. Uh, next slide. Um, in our uh, standards for the use or disposal of sewage sludge, uh, surface disposal is covered at uh, 40 CFR 503 subpart C. There's a whole chapter on this. And then land application for growing crops is in 503 subpart B. And then incineration is in 503 subpart E. Uh, in uh, EPA Region 9, we only have one incinerator. However, this is much more common in, on the East Coast and in the north central part of the U.S. and then also in Alaska, but there's only one incinerator here. And then disposal in the landfill, uh, there's a reference in 40 CFR 503 to the regulations for land, 40 CFR 258. And uh, for each of these disposal methods, there's a different set of monitoring requirements and a different set of management practices. See, any questions so far? Okay, next slide. Um, for surface disposal, the primary requirements are a requirement, uh, if you place the sludge on the land for disposal, 
is to do groundwater monitoring or to get an assessment by a qualified groundwater scientist that there's no potential for groundwater contamination. If it's like, you know, several hundred feet to groundwater, then there wouldn't be a concern. If it's five or 10 feet, then there would be a concern and there'd be a need for monitoring or, or not uh, using surface disposal or lining the surface disposal site. Um, then another requirement is to meet vector attraction reduction requirements, which is uh, preventing fleas and rats and other vectors from getting in. And the most common way to do this is to cover the site with soil by the end of each day after the septage or uh, sewage sludge has been disposed, or you can treat it with lime and raise the pH to 12. We'll get into this a little more. Um, or you can air dry it in a drying bed and to the point where it's been dried for several months and there's no longer a vector attraction reduction issue. And then there's also requirements for um, restricting public access and access by domestic animals. Uh, you need to restrict access for three years after the uh, uh, final uh, septage has been disposed. And this was an issue at that uh, place on the Hoopa lands where th th that pond before, because they had a fence, but it wasn't really enough to ensure that there wasn't any public access to the site. Um, and then uh, there's a prohibition on growing crops on the site for uh, while it's active and then for three years after it's closed. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, Lauren, we actually have a question in a moment. So Lori asked for surface disposal, how thick a level is allowed? How thick? Um, we don't really have a uh, standard for that. Um, if it's, uh, you know, more than like 18, 20 inches, um, we'd be concerned like it would be a sludge monofill. And at that point, we need to assess if there was a need for methane because methane could be generated if it's, you know, on the order of 18 inches or so at, at any one time, then the methane generation probably isn't going to be an issue. So, um, you know, we wouldn't be concerned about that, but it would need to be such that, you know, there's no runoff and, um, so that, you know, it's, if it's, uh, you know, becomes a monofill, then methane might be a concern. Okay. So um, if you have a surface disposal site where you're disposing of the sledge uh, permanently, then there's a requirement to monitor for three pollutants, arsenic, chromium, and nickel, if the site's unlined, if the site's lined with tarps or whatever, then you don't need to monitor for that. And this also only applies to sludge from a treatment plant. It doesn't apply to septage, uh, domestic septage. And there's a closure plant. You need to prepare a closure plan when you're not gonna be adding any more sludge to the site uh, so that it would be permanently closed. So um, next slide. Um, so uh, when does temporary storage become disposal? Um, and um, there's a clause in 503 that this subpart does not apply to sewage sludge stored on the land or to the land. It also does not apply to sewage sludge. It remains on the land for longer than two years when the person who prepares the sewage sludge demonstrates that the land on which the sewage sludge remains is not an active sewage sludge unit. So, you know, typically you you could store sludge for up to two years, and then after that, we determine that it is a surface disposal site. It's permanent uh, surface disposal unless you have documentation that it's longer temporary storage. And there's quite a few facilities that you know, particularly small facilities and they have, uh, you know, small amounts of sludge. So they don't want to haul it somewhere else for land application or for sending to a landfill unless until they've collected enough. So they can demonstrate that, yes, it is still temporary storage, 
but they need to have that document. And so after two years, they need to have in their files that uh, it is still temporary storage and give a reason for why it's temporary storage and it's not a surface disposal site. Let's see the next slide. And then um, there is also the question of when treatment becomes storage. Uh, so a lot of facilities have drying beds and the sludge dries out and then it sits there. And at what point is it no longer treatment and becomes storage? And that's also, you know, sometimes hard to define. Uh, methods for defining that would be, you know, if it's being dried out for the purpose of killing off pathogens or achieving vector attraction reduction in a drying bed, then we'd consider it treatment. But if it's been sitting there for several years and it's no longer really getting dried out further or achieving these, then at some point we'd say, you know, this is not, this is no longer treatment. And it's sort of on a case by case call in that uh, instance. And if it uh, has gotten to the point where it meets the criteria for pathogen and vector attraction reduction. It's been dried for more than three years and it's dried to over 90% solids. Um, then, you know, at that point, it we'd consider it would uh, be storage as opposed to treatment at that point. And then uh, if there are specific plans that, well, you're dr trying to dry it out further um, or you have other plans for it, then, you know, that should be documented. Otherwise, it would, at some point, we'd say, well, it's no longer being treated. It's uh, storage, and if it's more than two years, it's surface disposal, and you need to meet the surface disposal requirements. Okay. Uh, next slide. Um, so if you are demonstrating that something is still in temporary storage, although it's been there for more than two years, you need to have documentation. So that would include the name and address of the person who prepares the sewage sludge and the owner of the site where, where it is, and then the location of the site, um, latitude and longitude and uh, address, and then an explanation of why it's being stored for more than two years. And in some cases, this is you know, only, well, you know, you're waiting to um, accumulate enough so that it's cost effective to haul it to a landfill and you do have plans to haul it to the landfill. Um, but uh, in some cases, if there isn't any plan, then you'd need to come up with one or, you know, we determine it to be permanent surface disposal as opposed to temporary storage. And then the sur at that point, the surface disposal requirements would kick in. And then you'd also need to estimate a time period when it will be moved somewhere else for use or disposal. And, you know, this can be, you know, well, 20 years off if, if it's a very small site and you think it's going to be 20 years before you accumulate enough uh, to haul it off site. But there should be some kind of estimate as to just when it's going to be hauled off. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, here's a picture of a uh, um, lagoon at the Luka Chukai Boarding School, which is a BIA operated on Navajo lands. And uh, um, this is an example of like ponds and uh, at least one of these ponds, they're looking at letting it sit in place and dry out. And then at that point it would become a surface disposal site. They're, but they're also looking at hauling it off. Um, and one of the ponds is still active and it could be active. You know, they're still receiving effluent uh, or, or um, influent wastewater. So uh, it's continuing to be active. Uh, this is a facility that had an permit. So there were conditions written into the NPDES permit on handling the sewage sludge and it's terminating its permit now because it's no longer going to be discharging effluent, but it's still subject to the sewage sludge regulations. So if one of the ponds closes and is no longer taking in new effluent, then at some point they would need to 
uh, meet the surface disposal requirements and they'd have to determine at what point it's uh, just um, being disposed, it's no longer in treatment or, you know, or, or if they do want to move it somewhere else. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, next slide. Um, one of the critical things if a surface disposal site is used or if an uh, um, area is determined to be a surface disposal site because the sludge is not going to mo be moved out of there is groundwater monitoring. And this uh, requires getting someone who is a qualified groundwater scientist to look at the site and determine if there is a potential for groundwater contamination and they need to look at, uh, you know, what is the depth of groundwater and is the groundwater usable and uh, other parameters associated with that. And then either determine that yes, monitoring is required or um, uh, no, it's enough of, there's enough depth so that there isn't a chance for groundwater contamination. At this uh, photo that we showed earlier of the site on the Hoopa lands, um, they, uh, they're they looking to see if there is groundwater information available now. They think it's probably several hundred feet to groundwater, so it's probably not an issue, but that's something that uh, they need to determine and if necessary, set up a groundwater monitoring program. And they'd made some initial proposals to do groundwater monitoring, but they still need to get more background. Um, our, we, we have an office at, in our region that handles groundwater issues. And so someone there might have background on and you know, know just what monitoring has been done to date. Uh, and what information on the groundwater depths are available in the area in question. But so that's a like a first point to check with. And then after that to um, look at would be knowledgeable about just like the groundwater situation in that area is and whether it is of concern or not. Okay, uh, next slide. A couple more questions for Lori. Well, the first one is the picture from Hoopa looks as if a dry creek was being used for storage. Is that accurate or just my misinterpretation? Um, I don't think that's determined to be a dry creek. I could go check on that. Yeah, I, I think it yeah, it wasn't it had hadn't been determined to be a dry creek, but okay. and the second question is as for coastal sites, does ocean water monitoring at a near point need to be done or no? Well, you need to ensure that it's set back far enough so that there's no chance of disposal to ocean water. And um, there's a, like, uh, um, well, in the rule itself, it's 10 meters, but you probably want to look at, you know, additional just to make sure that there isn't any discharge because it would be a violation of the Clean Water Act if, if there was discharge to the ocean. So it would need to be set back far enough so that there wouldn't be any um, discharge to the ocean. Okay. Um, let's see, regarding pathogen requirements, uh, if um, you're using the surface disposal, leaving it in place and covering it, um, well, the most common manner to achieve pathogen reduction would be covering it. And this is uh, to ensure protection against uh, bacteria and viruses and uh, worms and other pathogens. Um, for There's a number of other options for treating the septage or to achieve pathogen reduction. Um, one method, if it's been sitting in a place for a very long time, it may have the pathogens may have died out on their own. And so you can go in and test for fecal coliform, which is a form of bacteria. And then you need to collect at least seven samples during each sampling event and show that the geometric mean is less than 2 million uh, most probable number. So you need to go in and um, you know collect samples throughout the um, 
area where the disposal has happened and then uh, check and see, you know, run at least seven samples uh, during each sampling event and um, make sure that the geometric mean is less than that. And the sampling uh, frequency, it dep depends on the size, like for the first um, 290 dry metric tons, which is about 320 dry tons of sewage or sleptage, you need to run seven samples. Then if it was um, between 290 and 1500 dry metric tons, then you'd need to run 14 uh, grabs and then do an analysis. And this is in 503 as to the frequency, the larger the sizes, the more frequent you need to run these or the more samples you need to take. And then another option for pathogen reduction is drying in drying beds for over three months. And a drying bed is, uh, again, like a bed where you're spreading it, the sludge or the septage out at about 18 inches or so, um, and uh, then drying it. And so you need to dry it for at least three months and this is during non-freezing weather. And after that, it would be considered to meet what we call class B pathogen reduction, which means it's, uh, it's suitable for growing crops, but uh, you, need, you have public access restrictions. You need to restrict public access for at least a year. And then some of the methods that are used at larger treatment plants are digesting in a digester at certain times and temperatures. You keep in a digester for at least 15 days at at least 95 degrees if it's an anaerobic digester, and 40 days to 60 days if it's an aerobic digester. Um, and then composting also at specific times and temperatures. And then uh, there's, well, there's two classes of pathogens that we recognize, we call them class B and class A, and class B is suitable for land application for non-food crops, and class A is um, considered to be pathogen-free, so you can distribute it in a nursery to the general public or whatever. Um, and uh, if you digest at high temperatures or if you compost at high temperatures, you can achieve class A, and this is spelled out in the rule as to just what times and temperatures you need to meet to achieve class A. Um, and I think one of the things that the Hoopa tribe was looking at was uh, composting where they would bring it up to high temperatures. And this is for uh, future septage or, and wastewater solids. And so they would compost it and then keep it at the high temperatures. And so they could then uh, use the resulting compost uh, without further restrictions. Okay, yeah. um, one of the common methods at small treatment plants is to use a drying bed. And uh, again, um, this, when you first fill up the drying bed, it should be a few, I say a few feet deep. Um, and then six to 12 inches after dried. It's not really uh, laid out in the rule itself as to what depth it needs to be, but it's understood that you want to keep it so it's, you know, when it dries, it's no more than about six to 12 feet deep. And so it's been totally dried. Um, and we often get the question, uh, is a, if you put the sludge or the septage in a stockpile, does that consider drying and does that go towards the three months that it would need to be dried to achieve class B? And the answer is no, uh, um, it's not going to completely dry and it's not going to get the, uh, the um, treatment by the sun uh, if it's in a stockpile. Uh, so um, if some, if you stockpile it up, you can't count that towards the uh, three months that it needs to be there to achieve the class B pathogen reduction. And next slide. Here's an example of a stockpile. And this is actually a sewage sludge from a small treatment plant that um, 
you know, they dry, they dried, so they dried it for quite a few months to um, completely dry it out, and then they put it up in the stockpile. So they'd met the three month criteria, and after that, they put it into stockpiles, and now they they let it sit there for about a year and then distribute it. Okay. Um, and the common methods for surface disposal for vector attraction reduction, which is separate from pathogen reduction, it's another criteria, and it refers to stabilizing the sludge adequately so it doesn't attract fleas and uh, insects and so on. And so uh, the most common manner of achieving vector attraction reduction when you're using surface disposal is to cover it with soil. And that's like six to 12 inches of soil. So it's completely covered. And you do that at the end of the day, like each time you uh, bring in additional sludge and put it on the surface disposal site, then at the end of the day, you need to cover it with soil. And so that's one of the things that wasn't happening at this um, Hoopa site was they, they were putting it there, but then they weren't covering it with soil. And I don't think they were lime treating it either. Another option that you can use if you don't want to cover it with soil is you add uh, lime and then you have to raise the pH to 12 for two hours and then keep it at a, for another 22 hours at uh, pH 11.5. And then another option is you dry it to 90% solid. So in a lot of these uh, sites where they spread the sludge out and it was essentially drying, and then um, if they want to just leave it there permanently, then if it's dried to 90% solids at that point, it has achieved the vector traction reduction. And then they can uh, determine that it's no longer a drying bed, but it is a, a surface disposal site. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, and so monitoring, um, as I said before, uh, for surface disposal, monitor for three pollutants, arsenic, chromium, and nickel, if the site is unlined. And then uh, you need to instruct the laboratory to report your results on a 100% dry weight basis. So they'll get the sample, and it can be anywhere from you know, 15, 20% solids up to 95% uh, solids, but you need to have them test the percent solids and then convert it to 100% dry weight basis. So you, um, uh, uh, you know, you know what, what it is to compare to the limits. And so the laboratory, unless you tell them, they may send you the results, but they may not send you the percent solids. So uh, you need to go back and get the percent solids from them so you can compare it to the results. Uh, this is not recommend, uh, not required for septage, just for sludge for a treatment plant. Um, and, uh, you know, it's probably recommended that you also run it on septage to just see if you have anything unusual. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, so the limits for these pollutants depend on how close the uh, surface disposal site is from the boundary of the property. And so there are different limits depending on whether it's like between zero and 25 meters. This is all in uh, metric units. So zero and 25 meters up to greater than 150 meters. And so you need to determine how uh, how close the site is to the property boundary. And then based on that, uh, those would be your limits for these pollutants. Okay, next slide. Um, when you're looking at, um, you know, the benefits and issues associated with just leaving sludge in a pond and closing it, uh, as to, you know, as opposed to like sending it off site to a municipal landfill or having a land application company take it. Um, the benefits, uh, you're reducing the hauling and costs and uh, 
you know, some sludge gets hauled hundreds of miles uh, in diesel trucks, and that's an issue. Um, for this uh, Hoopa site, they were looking at one option, which was trucking it a couple hundred miles to this landfill that was located in Oregon. And uh, so, you know, there's a number of other issues uh, in, involved with that. Um, so, you know, that's one benefit. If you can leave it in place, uh, you reduce the cost associated with that. Um, the issues that need to be looked at are, is if it is near shallow groundwater or close to a site where it may wash off site, if it's close to the ocean or to a river or lake where there's a potential for runoff, then that would be an issue that would need to be addressed. Um, and uh, another issue is um, uh, making sure that the site isn't contaminated with other things. Uh, sometimes like a site that receives septage might also receive porta potty wastes or other materials. And so it might have plastics, um, aluminum or other contaminants. And so that's something that you need to check uh, if it's a septage disposal site, you want to make sure it's just domestic septage. Any commercial septage uh, mixed in with it, then it's no longer under EPA's 503 rule. It's under the uh, RICRA um, solid waste rule. And that has a number of other standards that would and a number of other permitting requirements that would need to be complied with. So you need to look at that. The question often comes up with uh, like septage. Well, if they get septage from restaurants, uh, which is mainly just uh, toilet flushings um, and food, is is that uh, commercial or uh, domestic? And sort of, again, you'd need to look at that on a case by case basis. If it's mostly just coming from toilets, then we'd probably say, yes, that is uh, domestic septage, if it's got, you know, a large amount of other materials being flushed down as well, um, you know, we need to call it a, a commercial septage. And so it would not be under 503 and it would be subject to the RICRA requirements for uh, solid waste. Um, and um, yeah, there's a, an issue also if the site is accessible by the general public or if the site's one where it's being planned to close off the site and then uh, change it into something else uh, where there would be public access, then it might might not be feasible. We had this issue several years ago with some land applied biosolids where they were growing crops and then uh, they suddenly sold off all the land and it was developed and residential developments were moving in. So that was a problem with uh, the, um, uh, you know, being able to meet the public access restrictions at the time that we were specifying. So that needs to be looked at if it's in a remote area where, or if it's on treatment plant lands where access is not an issue, then that wouldn't be a problem. Hey, Lauren, we have a question from Lori. Yep. Why monitor for only three pollutants? They seem like odd pollutants to find in human waste. Certainly not the only issues. Am I misunderstanding? Yeah, well, these pollutants are um, considered, uh, you know, the ones that might be likely to uh, impact groundwater. Uh, they have um, the leaching potential to impact groundwater. Uh, these are a different set of pollutants than the ones if you land apply for growing crops, and there's nine pollutants uh, that need to be tested for, including lead and cadmium and molybdenum and selenium and some others. Uh, but for the uh, groundwater monitoring for, uh, or, or for the monitoring for the um, surface disposal, it's assumed that only these three are of concern with respect to groundwater. And of course, the question comes up if you, you know, it's it sort of assumed that the surface disposal site will remain on treatment plant lands. And so there's the issue, well, you know, if you sold the site off and then somebody decided to start growing crops there, and then you would want to have the monitoring for 
the other pollutants that are in the land application portion. And we're currently looking at additional pollutants um, like the um, forever, forever chemicals, you know, PFAS and PFOA, and then microplastics and a number of other pollutants as to whether we should start monitoring for those both in land application and surface disposal. But at this point, the ones that were identified as being of concern for surface disposal were easy. And uh, again, and, you know, there, uh, you know, we do need to look at, uh, you know, is this land going to permanently be part of a wastewater treatment area, or is it going to switch to another use? In which case, um, you know, there should be a call on a case by case basis as to monitoring for other pollutants. Lori responded. Okay, thank you. That makes more sense. Likely older regulations too. I assume. Um, so uh, if a temporary storage site is to be decided to be a permanent surface disposal site, then steps to take would be you review the groundwater data for the area and see just what's been collected to date and then is more needed. And then you contact a qualified groundwater scientist to assess if there's a groundwater issue and then you develop plans for covering the sludge area or uh, or for liming it. And then you'd want to look to it. Uh, is, um, is there a currently a liner at the site? And uh, is it, what condition is the liner in? Because sometimes there's a liner that's been there for a long time and is not working anymore. So you'd need to assess that um, and assess if you need a new liner or uh, uh, other options uh, like uh, doing the groundwater assessment. And then you need to develop plans as needed for prohibiting public access. And sometimes this, you know, it's a question of, well, how much fencing do you need to put up so you ensure that the public isn't walking through the area? And in some cases, it's re remote enough, so that's not an issue. But in other cases, particularly if there's new development in the area, you need to make sure that there's adequate fencing to keep off humans and, and other domestic animals. And this, this can vary, you know, to anywhere from just a fence with a sign to a chain link fence if that's needed to keep the public out and, you know, signs saying septage or sludge disposed here. Okay, Lauren, you have another question. Lori asked, I guess then the question you have is when you find PFOA slash PFOS, which you will, what do you do? The waste still needs to be disposed of. Yeah. Well, you know, and you find that in everything. And so EPA is working very hard to come up with, you know, levels of concern. Because if you go out and, you know, in the test the soil around you, you'll probably find it. But just what is a level of concern. And so that's something we're all working on. I think if you find it, you know, like even parts per billion, you know, you need to put a flag up and then, you know, you might want to resolve to keep it in temporary storage until you find out, you know, when, when we do come up with limits uh, that are, um, you know, that are viable, because at this point we're sort of working towards that. But um, you you know, test practically anything and find PFAS and PFOA. So that's something that I think if you know you you could you know report what you found and then see how that compares with what's being found in the uh, general environment. Or you know, is that something that's showing that you have a much higher discharge of that? So yeah, I think if you know you get your monitoring results back and then try to compare those with what's what is being found. Uh, in background levels in the area. And hopefully we'll have some numbers out uh, before too long on, you know, what, what is the level of concern. But that, yeah, that is one. Want to uh, have uh, um, sludge receptage continue to be in temporary storage just so you can find, you know, are these levels that are of concern. Um, there's a requirement in the surface disposal site 
uh, requirements for monitoring for methane. And this was intended for what we call sludge monofills, where you have a deep monofill, you know, several feet deep at least, um, and then you're getting a release of methane. And so there's a monitoring requirement, and then it, there's limits. It can't exceed more than 25% of the explosive limit. And again, uh, you don't find this in areas where you've spread out the sludge, um, you know, and it's not, not really thick or it's um, mostly water. Uh, but if you had a sludge monofill where you had, um, you know, what solid sludge and several feet deep, then at that point, the methane monitoring requirements would kick in any uh, methane uh, samplers and determine that you weren't getting excessive methane. We haven't had any monofills like that in Region 9, except years ago there was one in Hawaii. But uh, other than that, we haven't had any. But there are a few. There's one large one in Utah, I think, and a couple of other places. So they do need to monitor for methane. Next slide. Um, so again, evaluating where the, a pond should be considered a surface disposal site. If it's still receiving influent, then no, it's still treatment. So it's, uh, you know, this the site of the um, BIA lands where they're still receiving influent, then that's not a surface disposal site. Uh, and if it's not, then can in covered in left in place. And then again, is there a potential for groundwater contamination? And so uh, you need to look, you know, what are there other uses for the land or, you know, is the best use just to leave it in place and cover it up? Uh, and, you know, is that, uh, would that be the best option? Okay, uh, next slide. Um, some of the documents um, on the EPA regulations um, in, including land application and surface disposal uh, are, um, you can get them at the website biosolids.epa.gov and they have a list of these and one is preparing biosolids for use or disposal that goes through the treatment processes and what these achieve in the way of pathogen reduction and vector attraction reduction and then what monitoring you do for land application or surface disposal or incineration. And then there's a special document on septage disposal and what are the options for that? And then one on land application and then one on surface disposal. So those are all available over this uh, biosolids website. Okay, uh, next slide. And that's my contact information. And I can send that out to anybody. And next, uh, next slide. Um, just real quickly on land application, uh, it has um, pollutant concentration limits for nine pollutants currently, um, and then it it has a required pathogen reduction, and you can't just cover it up. Uh, you need to uh, treat it to achieve. Uh, either this class A or class B pathogen reduction. And then it's got a separate uh, set of ways to achieve vector attraction reduction. And then it goes into more detail on the management practices and site and harvesting restrictions. Uh, it has an agronomic rate requirement. So um, you have to determine ahead, ahead of time what crop you're going to be growing with the sludge. And then uh, work with a um, agronomist on determining how much nitrogen the crop in question needs and what is a nitrogen breakdown rate uh, for the area in question and so what rate would you be applying the sewage sludge at and then it also has um, surf, uh, setbacks from surface waters and um, prohibitions from applying during uh, of freezing uh, when when the ground is frozen and several other site restrictions that has uh, well site restrictions for from public access as well and let's see next slide um, and if the sledge is going to a municipal landfill um, 
we don't really have any monitoring requirements. The landfill itself may have monitoring requirements. It may require testing to show that the sludge is non-hazardous and the fe uh, no sludge has ever failed the federal test for hazardousness, the TCLP test. However, uh, the state of California has a much more stringent test. So there have been a number of sludges that have failed the state's test. So that's something that if it's going to a state of California landfill, they may require testing for uh, the for the um, to make sure it's not hazardous. Um, the paint filter test is a very simple test. You take a paint filter and you put the sludge in, and then if any drips out, then it has free liquid, so then it can't go to the landfill. Um, so if you have septage, like, and you want to send it to a landfill, you'd have to either dewatering facility first, or you'd have to, um, uh, well, dewater it yourself uh, before you can send it to the landfill. And then the landfill must be in compliance with the uh, requirements in 40 CFR 258 for a landfill. So I think, well, most of the landfills um, are in compliance with this. We've had several instances, particularly in the Pacific Islands, uh, where the landfills aren't in compliance. So the uh, treatment plants shouldn't be sending their sludge to the landfills because they're not meeting the uh, requirements for landfills, but that hasn't been the case for the most part on the mainland. And um, real quick, Lauren, um, uh -huh. I wanted to add the link in the chat. It looks like biosolids.epa.gov has been updated to epa.gov backslash biosolids. Can I share that in the chat? Um, that might be. Yeah, uh, so I think, yeah, that, that might be the way. Okay, to, I'll share yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. See, any other questions? Okay, and if you've got other questions, uh, send me an email. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Loretta and Lorraine for the presentation and thank you everyone for participating. Uh, we have a few seconds left, if you wanna drop a comment or a thank you or a question in the chat. Uh, just a reminder that these videos will be posted eventually to the website, so you can always come back and review the presentation. And just, yeah, thank you everybody for participating. Okay, and again, yeah, send any questions you have. Uh, looks like there's no more questions. Maybe they'll trick in, trickle in, but um, I think we're good. Okay. I'm gonna hang a little longer, or you wanna wait? Yeah, and, uh, um, again, if anybody's got questions on where we are with um, PFAS and PFOA, um, uh, let me know and I can send in the updates as, as they come in. All right, I'm going to stop the broadcast, but we can hang out here a little longer if you want to see if there's any more questions. Okay.